Tony. How are you? Oh, oh, John's here too. All right. Oh man, this is this is so cool. Th thank you guys for doing this. Oh hey hey man. Hey. Um, no problem. What's, what's going on? What you guys There's doing? Like a guy on the screen. Oh. Uh, hey, uh, you guys. Uh, you guys, you guys doing okay? Did you, did you did you forget we had an interview today? No no no. We got every, we got everything set up. We're good. Oh, uh, is it? Is that okay. Why we were meeting. No, that's why we're meeting. Uh, all right, um, not a problem. Hey, um, do you? Uh, I, I got I got all the all the stuff ready for the for the interview. Um, do you got your do you got your disk drive handy? You know, for props and all that. Oh, I don't think he knows about that. No. No. Knows about what? Did you just spill beer all over your face? I don't child? think no. I don't think he. You don't. I, you know. What are you talking about? You know. You know. There's no disk drive, right? No 64DD. What are you talking about? He doesn't, You've done he doesn't videos know. on it. Yeah, you, I guess. You, you flew to Seattle about this thing. That was the whole point of this interview. The magic of the screen, right? <laughs> uh, it's all fake, man. It's a, it's a green screen gimmick. There's no disk drive. You're, it's you're all, all you, right? no, all of you, all of you two, it's not real. It's not real, you know. It's like the Matrix. Yeah, PewDiePie is a Google algorithm they're testing. Red Letter Media is actually a, a variant of Violet. Um, John's not even real. He's a practical effect. Look, my hands go hand goes right through him. The hell, man! I'm real. Oh, I'm sorry. That was a little hard. He looks good for an effect, though. Welcome to the channel everybody, this is Tony here, want to give you a quick note before we start the interview. This is the abridged version at about 40-ish some minutes. If you'd like to watch the entire thing, which is about an hour and 15 minutes, an extra half hour, check out the James at Games channel. It will be in the card above and in the description below. That's where you can find the whole shebang. Without further ado, enjoy! <laughs> All right. Well, I wanted to thank you guys for uh, setting aside this time and coming out and uh, answering all these questions because um, I know uh, for a lot of the the uh, the community who was already involved in this stuff, a lot of these questions are already answered and they already know the answer. But for a lot of people who just watch casually on YouTube, they may not have all of the answers and they may mm. not really understand all of the, the nuances of collecting. Um, so for those of you on my channel who aren't familiar with these guys, I don't know what's wrong with you, but um, this is Tony and John <laughs> from uh, Hard for Games. Hey guys. Um, I would get Tony to sing, sing the theme song, but he doesn't remember the words, apparently. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I do, but I well, also you did, can't You sing. did a pretty good like uh, poetry jam version of it. Yeah, that, yeah, that exactly. Funny. All you have to do to do a poetry slam is talk like this from Parks and Rec. Yeah, yeah no, uh, I, I was going to say, I think the theme song is... They're hard. They're hard for game. No, games are hard. They're hard for games. His name is John Tron. Wait, shit. John Tron. <laughs> How many beers have you had already? <laughs> Actually, just four. <laughs> just four. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> that's okay. I'm on like I'm like almost done with my third. So there you go. I just wanted something for the for your video. So <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Thank you for putting forth the extra effort. <laughs> there you go. His name is John Tron. All like, right. What? Well, first off, I'd like to start this off with um, asking, um, I'll ask Tony first, um, what do you feel like is the point of collecting and the whole preserving the past aspect of things? Because uh, a lot of people feel that we should leave, that what's in the past should stay in the past, like mm. technology is progressing and things are better nowadays, but obviously there's a large chunk of people who don't follow that mentality. Um, so what are, what are your takes on that? Well, I think that collecting and preserving can sometimes be different from each other and sometimes they could be the same. I think a lot of people collect for a, a variety of reasons. Some people like a hobby and they're, they're into gaming or maybe they had a nostalgic experience with a specific system. Like maybe if I had nostalgia for the SNES, you know, I might be particular toward the SNES and I, I might just want to collect for it because it kind of reminds me of my childhood and that simpler time, this and that. Like there's kind of like a psychological aspect of it. But in terms of preservation and collecting, you know, there's definitely a lot of media out there that's kind of either getting destroyed or getting lost, maybe because of the medium that it's on, 
or like development tools and software and programs that give us insight into like the history of what companies were doing at certain times. Like Nintendo, for example, is a big one for us. So preservation is important. So for example, Nintendo promised a lot of games uh, for the N64 DD. They didn't deliver a lot of games for the N64 DD. Yeah. We had nostalgia for those things, even though they never existed. So it's like kind of like trying to piece together and preserve what actually uh, still may exist out there. So right. I totally get the argument that, you know, it's in the past, just leave in the past. There's new great games, 4K this, 60 frames per second, da 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 da. Um, PC Master Race. Yeah, PC Master Race. <laughs> but if that's your thing, hey, that's your thing. And that's totally fine. I like that stuff too. But I do think that just like, you know, you could use that same argument for archaeology. Like, why would you go and dig up some fossils? That's in the yeah. past. Yeah. You know? I would actually disagree with that point because uh, digging up fossils is digging up something that we actually don't know anything about hardly. Um, whereas, you know, you you were alive during most of that time. I was alive during the, the a, a good chunk of the sixty four time. I remember it, um, which so makes us a, fossils. A lot which makes the, us fossils. <laughs> what was that? Which makes us fossils. Yeah. I mean. Pretty much, yeah. Well, th think of it. Think of it this I, way. I, I didn't want to say it that way, but you, you pulled it out of me. So yeah. yeah. So think of it this way. Like, yeah, well, you may know something exists, but it doesn't mean that you know the entirety of it. You know, most dinosaur bones don't have a complete skeleton. Mm -hmm. You go to a museum and you see a T. Rex skeleton. You know, and let's say it's actually some of the real fossils on display, right? Chances are, ninety-five percent of that skeleton's plaster. Mm -hmm. So right. so we may know that. Um, a particular title was going to come out, but we may not know what the contents of that title was going to be necessarily, mm -hmm. or like the full, the, the sort of the fullness of it, you know. But I mean, I, I do get that. Obviously, there is a, a difference between natural history of the earth and yeah, yeah. you know video game history. But you know, it, to try to, to explain to someone who maybe doesn't kind of grasp that that aspect of it or like why would you you know it was canceled get over that kind of thing um exactly it's kind of it's kind of a, a unique curiosity i guess i guess i would say yeah i i would also say that um i've noticed this uh doing a lot of garage sales going around looking for games and stuff like that uh there seems to be like when a product is new it's the hot thing mm -hmm. and about 10 years later everybody wants to forget it and move on to the next thing hmm then 10 years after that, you get a few niche people going after it. But 10 years after that, maybe it's like, I mean, you go to a garage sale now and stuff that used to be the ugly stuff from the 70s and 80s is going for crazy prices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, uh, I walked through a house recently where you could tell it was a, uh, it was a couple that had passed away recently it's, who were doctors. An estate sale? Uh, yeah, it was an estate sale. Yeah. And they clearly hadn't redone any part of their house since the late 70s and they had just kept it like immaculate to that and walking through i'm pretty sure if i would have seen it 10 20 years ago i would have thought it was hideous but it was absolutely beautiful uh -huh. and i was like i want to preserve this and just keep it i don't even want to live in it mm -hmm. i just want this to be and then i realized it was like it's kind of like games it's like people want the nostalgia but then i think slowly there starts to be more things growing out of it yeah yeah i can actually i can relate to that personally um yeah. cuz i didn't have i didn't have the nes growing up um i had a snes uh even though i was born like right around the n64 era i somehow never got one and ended up with the snes <laughs> um <laughs> But, uh, like, I, I never had a NES growing up, um, and I have one now, and I have a power glove, and, like, all kinds of stupid stuff like that, that nowadays I know objectively is bad. Like, Simon's Quest. Simon's Quest was the first game I got for it. Mm, uh, and that's probably one of the worst games I've ever played. Yeah. But I still boot it up and play it every so often, just because it's something, it's it's got, like, this mystery, because it, it's, like, it's like a link to, it's a link to the past, aha. Uh -huh. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, swing um <laughs> it's, it's just i don't know i don't know how to explain it it's 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 kind of weird but yeah like i i get what you're saying about walking through and like looking at all the old furniture and like it makes it makes sense it resonates so yeah i mean that, that's kind of a roundabout uh way to answer your question but i mean again i think there's a lot of different reasons why a lot of different people collect or, or preserve but i think those kind of encapsulate 
the basis of why we do it, I think. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. Um, so if that's the case, um, what's your what's your goal eventually with your with your collection once um, you're either no longer able to maintain it or god forbid something happens like um what's what's your plan like are you going to give it to your wife or is john just going to break in and steal it one day like what's the what's the plan you're going to donate yeah. to a museum P- yeah. most likely john but yeah i mean i think um you know i've kind of switched my collecting from collecting like quantity to curating specific items so it used to be all about like i go to a garage sale I'll scoop it all up you know, now I Which, sort of... That's getting pretty rare now. They, uh, you can barely even do that anymore. But yeah. point being is that, you know, my collection is is growing at a much less um, rampant rate because I'm not attempting to just grab everything I can. I'm being very specific with what I'm, I'm getting. But in terms of, like, sort of uh, maintaining it in terms of space, that really isn't a, a big deal. But um, I guess in terms of, like, an end goal... You know, I think your, your question kind of had two parts. Like, where where am I going with my collection? And you kind of partially hinted, like, what happens to it if I die? So, <laughs> well, that's... I don't want to be quite that morbid with it. Yeah. But, but, so, but yeah, yeah know, like... no, but no, but that's a, that's a fair question. So, the end the end goal. I mean, really, there's no end goal. I mean, it kind of continues, right? We have some yeah. holy grails that we're searching for, and we have various contacts who are assisting us in reaching these holy grails that hopefully one day we may possibly find uh partially for those nostalgic purposes partially for those those historic purposes uh but in terms of what happens when it uh I, we die you know it would probably anything that uh is owned by hard for games because it's actually we you know we own an llc so it's actually a lot of my collection i collect with the company so it actually okay. is company uh property some of it's my own, so it really kind of depends on whether I purchased it or we collectively purchased it. So, um, you guys are kind of known for the 64 disk drive. Um, that was actually how I uh, found both you and Metal Jesus Rocks, was I think someone had posted it to Reddit. Um, but um, it's, it kind of seems to me like the community's perception of you guys um, may just be the the timing of the videos that I watched, but it, it just seemed like in the comments and everything that everyone thinks of you as the 64DD guys. Um, is that something that you wear proudly that 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 you're you're 100 with being called that, or uh, would you rather people realize that there's there's more to the Hard for Games crew than just uh, rare developmental hardware that literally nobody else has? <laughs> Do you want to well, go first? Well, I, I guess we could say we'd prefer to be more 3D, but it would be more retro to be two-dimensional characters. That's a good metaphorical answer. Yeah. To <laughs> it is. Uh, I, when news actually I see broke, why you keep them around now, Tony. <laughs> that, um, this guy. When news broke that Metal Jesus got that, and people were tweeting at us and trying to get us on Reddit... And uh, I was on 4chan's retro gaming board at the time, and somebody had started a thread, and somebody in the thread said, hey, he should contact Hard for Games. And I was like, oh my god, I got mentioned. And then somebody else responded to that, fuck off, shill. And I was just like, oh, it's awkward, because I am actually literally reading right now, but that wasn't me. So if I would have posted, you could have called me out on that. But no, that was someone else. Yeah. Like <laughs> It's like you had your you had your 30 seconds in the spotlight. Like every time I've ever seen our names come across 4chan, somebody has assumed it's a shill, mm. which is hilarious because I'm reading it. Yeah, so I think that to answer your question, it's good and it's bad because you so for example, we had done DD stuff in the past. I think basically we're primarily known for yeah. rare development hardware with the, the 64 DD, and secondarily we're known for our beta questing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And those are probably our two most popular things. So, you know, it's good that people know us for something, and it's good that people can count on us for preserving, you know, um, old content and that that sort of thing. And so I, I think you know we wear it proudly. You know that said. You can't, as far as like content on a show goes, it is a slower trickle with development content. It is a slower trickle because with yeah. DD stuff because it just doesn't come out as 
new information we doesn't come out. Literally haven't made DDs since the nineties. Well, so, yeah, but know, I, it's, it's not a matter of producing them. <laughs> it's a matter of it's a very slow trickle for like people to have the hardware to actually access what's on those discs. Yeah. Uh, it's extremely rare that blue discs show up, mm -hmm. and almost every single one we've ever touched has been blanked. Yeah, except for some weird ones. We can get into that in a minute. Yeah. But, but point, my point is, is that you know we're very happy to be known for those things. Uh, however, you know, part of the challenge is, is where do you go as just as a channel in terms of content? Like, yes. where do you go from there? So we branched off into like development discs and sort of rare limited edition, special edition hardware and that kind of stuff. Yeah. But we also do do a lot of reviews and live streams and you know some other great content. We don't content. do a ton of live streams, but we, we, we do do live streams. We do streams. do live streams. I am a lazy man, but I will <laughs> see to it that I get at least two a month John's, in the future. John's gonna be doing more live streams in the future, but point is, is that, you know, it, it's weird because the way YouTube's algorithm works is that they, it notices when you produce DD or BetaQuest content and it pushes that, but then you try to do a review and it gives you a gentle nudge. Instead of like a, instead of actually showing it to your subscriber base, so it's kind of this weird thing where it's like, it's good that we're known as that, but as a channel holistically, it becomes challenging to pr produce other content that gets viewed. So I, I, I can actually a hundred percent relate to that because um, I do game reviews, and um, lately, in order to capitalize on the whole YouTube thing, because like you have to upload so often or otherwise you get buried. Yeah. Um, I just I was posting just random videos. Like there was one where I was like, "Oh yeah, this is my opinion on the Switch." Blah blah blah. Yeah. I just pointed a camera at me and one take just just talked. Yeah. Um, and then I did a follow up video to that, and that one YouTube just like clicked the "I choose you" button. Uh huh. And um. <laughs> Ever since then, my reviews have gotten buried, which sucks, <laughs> you know? But, um... Yeah, oh, it's, yeah, it's the the YouTube, the Facebook, like Google's algorithm, and basically the algorithm of these social media sites is actually what I also do for a living, for, for work. Is, is Not primarily what I do, but it has a lot to do with what I do, because I, I do marketing for a living. And it is a funky and strange beast to deal with. Uh, but, that said... The popularity of these DD videos has upped our base enough that our reviews do get more views than they did in the past, which is awesome. And don't get me wrong, like, it is freaking amazing that we were able to get information about the DD out there, and we've made so many great contacts about it, and then they've contacted us about, like, new discoveries and those sort of things. So we are 100% absolutely happy about it. But it does pose some weird challenges being known for specific things, if that answers your question. So it's, it's really yeah. good, but it's also a little bit strange, too. Everyone wants to find Ura Zelda, right? Everyone wants to find uh, Star Fox 2. Um, everyone wants to find those games that never actually came out. Mm -hmm. um, so what would you say is the first thing that somebody should do um, if they happen to come across a box? Um, like, I don't know if you saw the article or not, but um, some dude uh, bid on something from eBay and it was like a box of just old stuff from, from uh, Blizzard. Um. And he opened it up and he happened to find the gold copy source code for the original StarCraft. Oh, okay. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> That's so, a lucky um, find. Yeah. What do you do <laughs> in that situation? There's, you know, it's, it's weird because there's a lot of lightning in a bottle situations like that. And there's a lot of people who also have prototypes, but they're hoarding them. Yeah. You know, but in terms of what you can do, if you're of the mindset that it's something that you would like to share with the world, you know, I mean, first off, you know, if it's, if it's something like that's bootable, like a cartridge or something like that, don't boot it. Don't attempt to do anything with it yourself would be the, yeah. the number one thing I would say because you can accidentally delete it, you can you can destroy it, you can there's lots of bad things that could potentially happen. So put it in a in a space that's safe, that's not overly humid, not overly dry, this and that, and contact someone if it's of this our specialty, something that we know how to do, we can help you with it. If it's not, we can find out how to help you with it, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but there there are definitely 
Uh, don't try to do anything that you don't know how to do. I, I can imagine that the temptation is real to, to do something with that. Because, like, like if I ever found an MPDP cart of the original Metroid Prime, I would do unholy things to that cart before anybody had a chance to, to look <laughs> yeah. at it. Sure. Yeah, I would I would probably plug it in, and then if something shorted in it, I would just tell everybody it came blank. Yeah. And then if somebody found I, something out later so, that it had stuff on there, be like, what a wonderful surprise! So let me let me tell you an example of something that I did that was stupid before I knew better. Okay, that was, this is actually gonna be a later question, so uh, this, is, this is gonna be good. Do you want me to tell you now or later? <laughs> Go for it. Okay, so uh, you may be familiar with the Satellaview, right? And the Satellaview, you could download exclusive games and content onto these little like memory packs, essentially, and. You know, one of the big things with Satellaview is you get the little, B, you know, the, it's called the BS broadca Broadcast Satellaview cart and you put the little memory pack in there and you see if there were any games that someone downloaded. Maybe it's, uh, you know, the Zelda game that's for Satellaview, one of the Zelda games. Maybe it was one of those, you know, proprietary, not proprietary, but like Excite Bite games or the sequel to F-Zero, that kind of thing. So Yeah, the BS F-Zero. Yeah. yeah. So I had one and I popped it in, okay, and... I can't read Japanese, and at the time I didn't know the difference between height and EA, so yes and no, right? So I'm going through, and I'd scanned through everything. There were no games on this, but there were some screenshots of like a like a music group and some screenshots of Chrono Trigger. So basically, I think on Satellaview, and I could be wrong on this, they allowed people to like preview images of upcoming games. Okay, and so there fair. were there were some images of Chrono Trigger on there, not the game, nothing you play, it wasn't Radical Dreamers or anything like that, which also came out in the Satellaview, but just some images. And so I back out of the menu, I press a button and it deletes everything. So, and I, I never, <laughs> never, I was so pissed off that I didn't wait. He called me and apologized, more or less. <laughs> like, I was so pissed off. Because he knows I'm off. a big fan. I, I, and again, it was only like two screenshots and they were areas that I recognize in the game. They didn't look beta, like nothing like that. It wasn't anything of great significance that was lost, but I lost it nonetheless because I was, uh, ru like I was rushing. I didn't know what I was doing and I just thought I'd do it myself without trying to translate the Japanese. And, and again, in my case, it wasn't a big loss. However... Yeah. It could have been a big loss. It could have been a huge loss if there was some undiscovered game on there. So, you know, out of my own experience, I say, be careful. Go yeah. slow. You know, Go get slow. Help. And uh, now we have, uh, you know, uh, Google Translate, which is, will help you. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not the greatest. Um, it's quite buggy, but at least you'll, like, be able to swipe over something and be like, oh, that says delete. Like, you'll at least get that little bit. Yeah. You can't play a game with it. Not nearly yeah. yet. Going along with the Satellaview example, um, you could connect uh, Pokemon Crystal to uh, the... In, in Japan, they had, like, this really weird Game Boy adapter uh, that you would plug into your cell phone, and it would give you an active internet connection. And that was how you got... That was how you downloaded the Celebi event, and that was you downloaded all kinds of cool things. Um, there are no known carts, as far as I'm aware, that have saved data from the Satellaview, or from whatever they called it. Um, so whatever information that they that they changed, we don't know. Mm. Um, so examples like that, um, but that still continues to this day. The DSiWare uh, Japanese shop was shut down before. Um, a handful of games were able to be dumped. So there are games, even as few as last year, that people are never going to be able to play until mm. yeah. Nintendo decides to release them again. I know that there's, uh, for the PSP, a few games had GPS-enabled functions before they uh, decided the GPS for the PSP would not be an international release. Like uh, Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops, there's some... Oh. Like, very minor stuff. It's like you could go around and almost Pokemon Go try and find guys to recruit. But there is some uh, stuff in that game you can't get because you have to import the, the GPS to the U.S. and then plug that in. And that hope the Japanese GPS will work over here because I think they use a different uh, satellite constellation. I'm sure they do, yeah. Yeah, makes sense. 
Because I think we yeah. use Magellan, and they might use Glonass over there. That's yeah. <laughs> that's info you don't get with other channels. That's right. Only only, only with John. So that's this right. Is, this is another reason why we should keep you around. That's right. Yeah. Going along with the whole destruction of the past element to things, um, the Nostalgia Nerd did a did a YouTube. I think he's got like 10 or 11 episodes of it. He may even have more now. I haven't seen it in a while. But um, where he basically went through old shoeboxes from his childhood and dug out floppy disks of just random DOS and Windows 3.1 programs. And it was literally what's on my disk. Because he, he had no clue. Um, I don't know if you still have floppies laying around, but I have labels on floppies God, that I I have anymore. probably been er erased and rewritten over 15 times since the label was written. Um and there were some great examples of programs that nowadays have no utility. Like, um, there was one for Windows 3.1 that I think did something with the multi-window. Like, it did something with window management. Um, obviously not, not important nowadays, but he legitimately might have the only copy of that software. Because I've never heard of that before. Yeah. Um, and just stupid stuff. Like, uh, there was like a coffee cup that you could have on the, and then you, if you knocked it over with an icon, it would spill and then you'd have to fill it back up again. Stupid stuff. It's, it's stupid. I remember some of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's stupid, but that there's legitimately might be only one copy of that software out there now. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know we already went over some of the things that the average person can kind of do to preserve that. Um, but Really, what what I wanted to know is, have you guys run across anything that um, that seems like like this is like I've never heard of this before. You've never heard of this before. I can't talk today. <laughs> um, there we go. <laughs> uh, five beers deep. Probably should have stopped a while ago. Um, but is there software where it's like like you guys come across it and you're just like. We're, we're the only ones that we know of that have probably even heard of this software in the last 20 years, let alone possess a copy of it. Um, or is it mostly most of the stuff you come across just standard? Uh, oh, well, this has like a tool for testing the read write speed of this disk drive or whatever. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that we've come across anything yet that's been... I mean, obviously, like, the hardware that we have is rare, you know, well, but... like, the firmware that's on the, the DD that we have is rare, Yeah, I guess but... you could say that. So, the firm... Because it self-boots. Yeah, so the... It's kind of a weird example, but... So, basically, your 64-disk drive has what's called an IPL, which is akin to, like, a firmware, and it's required to boot. But most 64-DDs don't... aren't self-booting. So, you basically, if you didn't know this, you would get a 64DD, try to boot it, and it just... nothing would happen. You need an additional cartridge uh, to boot it, and an additional cartridge for fonts and sounds for things to not get glitchy. So, mine just booted by itself, right? And so, Luigi Blood was like, well, that's weird, you know, like, why is it booting by itself? And the IPL is actually unique. It's completely one of a kind. Yeah. So it has been backed up. It is preserved on his site. Chances are there might be others somewhere, but this is the only one that's really been found. Yeah. I think uh, one of the issues is a lot of collectors will simply get them, and then it's just like more or less just a piece to put in their collection, and it's not necessarily played very much. So, I mean, what the hell do you even play on it? No, there's nothing to play on there's it. There's not really but, much to do. Yeah. So, uh I think uh, the person who sold it to us probably never realized that that was out of the ordinary. Yeah. Uh, we didn't know it was out of the ordinary until people started pointing it out. Then I Googled it, and then we saw just thread after thread from, like, Assembler from, like, the early 2000s of people going through the hell of trying to get one of those to boot. Yeah. Right. Yeah. N nowadays, you can actually use, like... Um a flash card and put the IPL on it. It's not perfect, but yeah. it, it, it will be somewhat workable. But that said, yeah, so that, that would be a piece of software that was particularly particularly unique. You know, there were other pieces of software that we come across, like testing software that is very rare, but not a one-off. Um, the last couple of, the last two or three blue discs I've tested had Mario 64 cart version on them. Not Mario right. Kart, but like the cartridge version of Mario 64. Someone either as an experiment or as a joke or were trolling or something just decided to write Mario 64 on a blue disc. And again, not the disc version. They'd be in, in absolutely no way playable. 
Like, heart games can't play on the disc. On, yeah. Uh, you know, it just it doesn't function that way. So, like, that was weird. Because it's like, oh, I found something, and then it's just Mario. Well, well, question, was it, like, the actual ROM, or was it, like, a binary? Like, just ROM. a random binary it was file? just the ROM was. was just thrown on it. But it wasn't playable on the hardware. It might have been someone, not at Nintendo, because anyone working on the DD would know that a cartridge ROM, in it's... It's technically too different. It'd be like yeah. it'd be like trying to. It'd be what's a good, I'm trying to think of a good example. It'd be like trying to uh, take your beer, pour it on a plate, and drink it. Like it doesn't. Well, if your plate has those little like edges. It, okay, should... it's a bad bad example. Okay? I, I, I like, just love how the first example you go for is drinking beer. Yeah, but it, but it's like it's just not possible. Like no one no one who knew what they were doing would ever do that. It, it's too. Um, so it well, must I mean, have been a like, collector like it, that did it. it that, that's weird. a valid point because, like, yeah. to me, uh, it makes sense because someone who's someone who's not quite as technical or someone who's not quite as doesn't really understand what's going on, that would be a pretty valid like first step. Like, oh well, I'll just grab a sixty-four game and put it on the sixty-four thing, and oh, it doesn't work. Oh well, you know. Um, you had showed me your N sixty-four um dev dev board or whatever it was called the 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 cart the emulation EverDrive thing. Oh, the I 64 drive. My words. 64 drive. Yeah. Yeah, that thing. I my words are just not coming to me today. Um, so, can you use that to dump your 64 carts? Like, is there like a program you load? It's like, yeah, it's yeah. A, basically like a flash cart where you can load emulator or I yeah. keep saying emulators. <laughs> basically, what <laughs> it is ROMs. is it, it, yeah. uh, 64 drive is created by Retroactive, and they also have uh, like a board that has N64 cartridge inputs. Sorry, there's crying in the background, my baby. But uh, it, it's called an ultra save. Basically, they have a program where you can dump uh, SCC4 cards. Yeah. It, it takes uh, surprisingly small amounts of time, unless it's a real big cartridge. Hmm. Like the the um, uh, some of the larger carts that we've tried to test um, yeah. have taken a little bit more. But I, have a lot, I, have I mean, it's, it's quick and it's easy. The yeah. first time we were going to use it, we we're like, we better put a game in this that we're okay with losing. Uh, so, so we, used Quest 64. we used Quest 64 in case a Quest 64 copy got bricked. Um, and it was like, done. I was like, wait, what? So I open it in Project 64 to be like, did that work? Bam, Quest 64 loads. And I was like, yeah. Well, okay, whoever made this program, you know what you were doing, because this works amazingly well. I was expecting it to, like, load me into a prompt, and I have to type things in, and, like, the clickety-clack-clack, clack, I'm in, you know, that sort of stuff, but no. Uh, yeah, you wouldn't, think the, you wouldn't think the 64 would have such high read speeds for something like that, to just read the entire cart in, like, two seconds. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, even the, the bigger one that was giving us trouble... Maybe 30 seconds at most. Yeah. Absolutely. And it was like, because it was just so big, it was like, it, 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 it. I don't know if you were, um, I don't know how into the emulation scene you are, um, but I just happened to see a thread in r slash emulation one day where um, this gentleman going by the name of BU, I think that's how you pronounce it. I believe um, he was attempting to do a B Y U U. Yeah, him. Yeah, he developed uh, Hegon and BSNES. Oh, okay. Didn't yeah. know that. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, all right, then. I look like an idiot now. That's fine. Um, but yeah, <laughs> so he was attempting to do a, a, a complete PAL ROM dump because a lot of the ROMs were, um, were corrupted or not good, even though they were verified good. Turns out they weren't. Um, so he had, uh, there was a donor in Germany who had sent him a hundred games temporarily as like a here, dump this, blah, blah, blah. Uh, USPS lost the package. I did hear about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's $10,000 worth of PAL Wait, games that they, they just lost. And it, it didn't show up until like, I think like a month and a half later. Oh, so they did show up. They eventually. did eventually show okay. up. And what had happened is the label got ripped off. Um, and then they basically just mailed him the label and included a letter saying, you need to ship things better, even though he was the receiver of the package. Wow. <laughs> oh okay, God. so it almost went into dead letter. Wow. Um, like, it, it got so bad to the point where he was like, he had opened a Patreon and he was like taking donations to like pay this guy back. 
Wow. Um, and then magically about a month later, they, they, they showed up. Um, wow. Okay. But... I was going to say, that's why um, if you're going to ship delicate stuff, never trust USPS. I, I would just extend that to never trust USPS, period. Yeah. Um, I, I had a friend, uh, I, I forgot one of my camping hammocks. It's just a very simple cloth, like, ripstop thing. Uh, and I was like, hey, could you ship that back to me? He's like, yeah, I'll just do USPS. Because, you know, it's cheaper. There was just a boot print. Somebody stomped on the package. <laughs> but luckily it was cloth. And, like, the carabiners were climbing grade carabiners. So it was like nothing could be damaged by a boot. But there was still that, like, just, like, the, the, the Duke Nukem boot stomp print right on the front of the case. I was like, yeah, this is why no one trusts you assholes. Like, yep. I think the only thing that could be better than that, I don't know if you've seen the, the, the meme picture that goes around, but someone had bought a phone on Craigslist, and when he opened up the box, there's just, like, a cock print on it. Oh I my think god. That's the only thing that beats that. That's awesome. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> but anyway, the reason why I uh, I'm bringing this up is <laughs> This is going places. Yeah, this is really getting uh, tangential here. <laughs> this is pretty great. Um but the reason why I'm bringing this up, the whole uh, thing is that obviously there's a lot of risk uh, to collecting and there's a lot of risk to um, preserving things. Um, what are some things that you would give as advice to people who are aspiring collectors as ways to minimize risk, as ways to minimize... Because, like, if you walk into a store and they've got, like, a box copy of Earthbound, that's like, okay, well, brick and mortar, it's probably pretty trustworthy. But if you're just, like, this random dude on Craigslist, it's like, what do you do? Sure. I mean, there's a bunch of things that you could do. Um, and you, do you mean, like, specifically in terms of, like, purchasing online, then? Or shipping? Or both? Either. Okay. Any, I, any, anything. Just, like, just how to... Because it's, like, um, like for a, a great example is I bought Daikatana, um, and it was 20 bucks, and it came factory sealed. And I don't think the dude realized that it was factory sealed. Yeah. Um, so, every so often, you'll, you'll kind of luck out with things like that. Um, but if the dude had sold it as factory sealed. Like, how do you know that it's actually factory sealed? How do you know that it's not just some it, dude? Yeah. Flips? Tricky. It, it definitely is, is trickier. I mean, uh, for starters, if you're doing something on eBay, I mean, starting just like simple brass tack stuff, check their, their user rating, you know, check the reviews. Yeah. Like, have they had any negative reviews in the last 12 months? Like you should probably check. And, and what was that issue? Cause you may have a bunch of positive, reviews of people that were duped, you know, or yeah. didn't realize something. And, and generally, you know, people who are selling, you know, uh, sealed copies of things don't have like hundreds of them. So chances are they don't have like thousands of reviews to scroll through. So check that first, you know, uh, communicate with the seller the best you can, you know, say that they, you, you know, USPS even always provides tracking for parcels. So, you know, make sure that, you know, you contact them first and be like, will I be getting tracking information regarding this? I, I require it if I'm going to be purchasing, you know, if you can convince them to do uh, UPS or FedEx, FedEx is extremely expensive, especially if it's uh, heavier or out of country. Yeah. But you know, UP, US, UPS is also extremely expensive if it's out, if it's out of country, you know, uh, just take steps to go with a carrier that you prefer. Take steps to make sure that you get the tracking information. Communicate with the seller. You know, uh, just do everything. Take everything. Do everything that you can. I mean, obviously, if you're purchasing something online, you're going. You're inherently taking a risk. But eBay, for example, does have very good steps and very good return policies and buyer protection and this and that. So I've never run into an issue. The the only issue I've ever run into was you know and even and it was with usps it wasn't um usps it was just specifically my mail carrier my mail carrier mixes up the houses on my street you know a, it's a big thing these days to take the shell of a game and or like do a sell a reproduction as a, a as an original a lot of the font and images and stickers there's things you'll notice like uh Get familiar with how the Nintendo logo looks, and uh, that's a really, really good example. Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, um, since you mentioned that, I have a car. I have a few uh, Game Boy cards here. They'll say at the top. I'm gonna show you guys, and then show the camera. But at the top, they say Nintendo Game Boy 
a lot of the aftermarket carts will say game or they'll say something different 8 bit they'll say whatever yeah. mm-hmm. or if you're just insane and you order games from Russia they they pull apart yeah, well, <laughs> you know, like those they're are not. Russian, yeah, <laughs> you know, like uh, that's actually relatively common for Russia, but it is meant for the struggle. Yeah, point point being is that just if you're going to be uh, be buying something expensive, just know what you're buying. You know, if it's if it's earthbound, know what it should look like on the inside and out, and truly investigate it. Ask for as many pictures as you possibly can get, and you know, determine whether it's real or not. You know, yeah. don't buy retro games from GameStop. You should ask where these games were stored in that person's house. Yeah. Were they yeah. stored in an attic? Were they stored in a basement? Were they stored in a garage? You know, are, are you guys smokers? Like, like what? All yeah, that yeah, exactly. Like those sort of things, like the same sort of stuff that you would, you would think about when you're buying anything else, you know, yeah. like what, how was it stored? You know, was it stored? Was it in a storage facility for 20 years or something yeah. like that? You know, cause, uh, up in the attic, it'll get so hot that the capacitors might get destroyed in the basement. It might be so humid that, uh, things will rust. Uh, basically, uh, oddly, buying the questions you'd have for buying used guns are almost identical for used games. It's yeah. never put them in those two places. Like guns don't damage get damaged nearly as much from the heat, hmm. but I mean, you'd more or less just want to say, "Have you been keeping up with this? Have you been taking care of this?" And yeah. like simple questions like that. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you guys once again for uh, for coming out and doing all of this. I, I really appreciate it. Um, it was it was pretty entertaining. I feel, and I think I think people are going to learn a lot. Awesome. Well, I mean, we we appreciate you reaching out to us, and you know, we always enjoy prattling on about nonsense. Yeah, getting getting <laughs> so, to ramble about stuff that isn't just beta quest. Yeah, exactly. So so for all of our viewers uh, out there that might be unfamiliar with James, maybe you haven't checked out his channel. James, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and maybe where they can find you. So yeah, uh, my name is uh, James at Games. I do I do the games in case you couldn't tell from the name. Um, I try to do um, all kinds of cool things that are interesting, which is why you're on YouTube in the first place. Um, I, my passion is uh, PC gaming, as I'm sure you can tell behind me, but I have dabble in consoles, and uh, in case you're an insane person like I am, uh, I like to, you know, <laughs> as the chip falls out of the game. Um, bootleg NES games that come from Russia, as you can tell the quality, it's so good. That's why the chip just fell out. So, um, yeah, if you're interested in that, that video should be live. By the time this video goes up, this should be live. Um, so check that out. That'll be all kinds of fun. And um, if you like to listen to people ramble about all kinds of weird things, because uh, I do cell phone repair for a living, so that's always fun to watch. You should follow me on Twitter, because I, I post all kinds of weird things about that. And, uh, yeah, that's just... Uh, at James at the games and my YouTube channel is James at games. So yeah, thank you very much for having me on guys I, I appreciate it. It was fun. You know for all of our viewers Make sure to check out his channel when you're done here today and check out his social media Give him a like all that good stuff and we will see you all next time Look my hand my hand goes right through him It, it doesn't it clearly doesn't look I exist look <laughs> See? It's gonna go right through them! Thank you again for watching. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to give it a like and a share, and we will see you guys next time.